Hey guys, so I am here to bring you another supplemental episode and once again I have been able to do a little bit of a theme with this one and the theme here is crime and conspiracy. So if you are ready to hear about some crime stories, some conspiracy stories, oftentimes a little bit of both, I have four books in that vein for you and then at the end I'm going to tell you about a book that I have been struggling to fit into any of these themed ones. It doesn't really fit much of anywhere, but it's been so long since I've read it now. I really need to get it in here and talk to you guys about why I read it and why I didn't rate it. So a little bit of an extra fifth book there at the end, but we'll, we'll do the fun stuff first. So this is in no particular order except how I read them. We're just going to start and go. So as you know, if you've watched many of these, I have an unhealthy obsession with the whole Nixon Watergate situation. I have read so many books on that topic, it's kind of wild. So when HBO decided to do a mini series about the White House plumbers based on a book by Eagle Bud Crow, who was one of the guys involved with the White House plumbers, I was like, okay, I have to read the book before I watch the mini series obviously. However, as I was reading it, I noticed a couple of things. One, it's an incredibly short book. So if you're looking for detail or depth, you're really not going to find it in this title. Secondly, you may not know this because you're not as wildly obsessed as I am, but Eagle Bug Crow is only involved with the White House plumbers through the break-in at the psychiatrist's office um, the psychiatrist for Daniel Ellsberg, the guy who leaks the Pentagon Papers. So the whole Watergate thing, Bud's not involved in that at all. He's there at the formation, but if you read The White House Plumbers and think you're going to hear about the inside story of Watergate or something, that is not what you're going to get here. And I knew that going into it because I know who he is, but other people might not. So just straight up, the fact that the miniseries goes past his involvement, they are basically vaguely using his book as inspiration, but they're not drawing a ton from it. This book is predominantly basically a mea culpa from Bud saying, I did something wrong, I'm so sorry, I got mixed up in this, none of this was correct. Basically saying, I'm sorry for my actions and I realize that this was all wrong now, but here's how someone who considered themselves not to be like a morally great person when this started got stuck in the middle of all of this. So again, it's really short. There's not a lot of deep detail into it. Watergate does not come up at all. It's a really interesting snapshot, but if you're interested on deeper Watergate history, you're not going to find that here. I maintain through all my reading that the best book that encapsulates Watergate in its totality is Watergate A New History by Garrett Graff. It's very long, but it does way more than this book does. So if you're curious, want to spend a couple of hours on the audiobook, whatever it is, it might be of interest, but otherwise just watch the mini series. There's more there and it's weirder, but unfortunately also in the weird is a lot of truth. I was so excited to finally get an audiobook of the new book from Brad Meltzer and Josh Mensch, The Nazi Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill. You have probably heard me talk about these books before because there are two other books in this like conspiracy series that they're doing. There's one on the secret plot to kill George Washington and one on the secret plot to kill Abraham Lincoln, the one that doesn't work. Needless to say, this conspiracy plot also doesn't work because otherwise history would be a lot different if they had managed to kill the big three at one of their conferences. But what I love about every single one of these books is they are written in the soapiest, most like hyperbolic fashion for a small piece of history that, spoilers, you know that it, this conspiracy secret plot whatever is not going to be successful in all three books. Obviously we know how Washington, Lincoln, uh, Roosevelt, Stalin, and Churchill end up dying and it's not in any of these plots. That weirdly is another reason I love these books, even though I feel like maybe I shouldn't, 
because they highlight these really interesting small pieces of history or small events in history that had they gone a different way would have been huge but we don't talk about them because they weren't successful and if you're talking about the large arc of history they're really just blips right but there are really important ramifications of these things I was really intrigued by the Lincoln one that came out a couple of years ago or last year but what happened there was it had a really really clunky and elongated ending and so I was really worried with this one that I would like the bulk of it but then I would just end up being really disappointed in the end kind of in the way that I was with the Lincoln one. So like one of the really interesting things, right, is that Iran in the beginning of the war seemed like an important place to have Nazi agents. So they sent in some undercover Nazi agents and then promptly lost contact with them. They thought they were dead and then they heard that the big three were going to have this conference in Tehran and they were like, oh my god, we have to get people in there somehow. And then very kind of like magically, their Nazi agents who have been building this underground network this whole time are like, hey, we're still here. And just like one of those things that sometimes it's like nonfiction is stranger than fiction, right? It was really wonderful. But the best part about this book is that obviously it's kind of hard to have like a satisfying ending when something like this kind of just falls apart or is unsuccessful. But what I really loved about the ending of this book is that it goes into depth on the hearsay and the different ways that the he said, she said, this might have happened, this might have happened, has really had ramifications all the way into the present. Like it's a conversation that like Germany and Russia were like still untangling, like really close to our present. And so I liked that they told this really, really like soap opera style, like secret agent story, and then talked about its historical ramifications in our present. So I think that this is probably my favorite one of the series so far, followed by the George Washington book and then the Lincoln, just because the ending for that one was so unsatisfying. But I just, I love this series. I don't think there's a wrong book to read. It just they read like fiction and they're marvelous and they tell you this small story you've probably never heard of and I just have such a soft spot for this series. Moving on to something that is definitely a little bit more traditional nonfiction, we have the declassification engine what history reveals about America's top secrets by Matthew Connolly. This is a book that despite the uh, top secret documents being found like seemingly in every politician's house ever at this point was a book that Matthew Connolly has been working on long before this became national news and just turned out to have a very very timely publication date. I found out about this book because he did an interview on Jon Stewart's podcast and basically Matthew Connolly is a researcher who was given the ability to data mine previously classified documents by the American government. So these are things that were previously labeled secret, top secret, but have since become available, available, uh, and are no longer like classified top secret. And the idea here is that we have too much top secret information. At this point, top secret really doesn't mean that much anymore. And what I was really interested to hear about as someone who's like a librarian is how like the National Archives and people who are trying to maintain and digitize, classify, our classified information are basically collapsing under the strain of all of this top secret documentation and how some of it really doesn't even have to be that way. But because so much stuff is classified top secret, it's really hard to keep secrets because so many people end up having to be in the know about this top secret information. So basically through the data mining project, Matthew Connolly and his team were looking for what makes something get classified as top secret and did these things really need to be classified as top secret and how can we better organize and manage the sheer amount of information that we are classifying and declassifying and right because declassification is also a huge process that is a total mess because we don't have the infrastructure of librarians and data managers to really handle it Oh, 
It was really, really interesting. So one of my favorite things was when he was talking about how the sheer amount of top secret information and classified information turns certain things into conspiracy theories. Basically his project showed him that the American government was more willing to let a conspiracy theory fester rather than declassify information that showed that they had just messed up. I think that his discussion of conspiracy theories, which is why I put it in this episode, and how certain things and secrets that are kept become conspiracies is also just really interesting. It's a smaller part of it, but I found it really funny. If you are interested in um, classification and top secret information reform, which is basically what Matthew Connolly is advocating for, it's a really, really interesting book and just his larger findings about what he saw in his this really, really big data mining project. So the most recent book that I've read on this list, but one of the uh, least recent in timing, is Crooked, The Roaring Twenties Tale of a Corrupt Attorney General, a Crusading Senator, and the Birth of the American Political Scandal by Nathan Masters. So this is a story from the 1920s, you may have guessed that, uh, about the Teapot Dome scandal mostly kind of. And so Teapot Dome is a scandal that begins during the Warren Harding administration and kind of filters through into the Calvin Coolidge administration during the Roaring Twenties. The two main characters at the center of this story are the uh, Attorney General, aforementioned in the title, whose name is Harry Daughtry, and the Senator, Burton Wheeler, who becomes obsessed because of things that happened prior to Teapot Dome to causing Harry Doherty's downfall. In general, most of the book is just a really interesting story about who Burton Wheeler is, who Harry Doherty was, how he became involved in the Warren Harding administration, how the Warren Harding administration functioned or didn't, and really just a very human story of how these two political Harry Daughtery in the beginning is more of a political giant than Burton Wheeler, but Burton Wheeler basically makes his entire career on this whole thing. And so it's a very interesting story in that sense as well. The present implication that the author here is trying to make is that the way that Burton Wheeler went after Harry Doherty and the way that he basically ran him out of office has huge implications on how we handle political scandals today. Burton Wheeler was a trained lawyer, but he realized that it was more important to indict Harry Doherty in the realm of public opinion rather than a court of law. And so while lawsuits do develop over Teapot Dome, Burton Wheeler is able to weaponize the media and a Senate trial to get rid of him rather than, you know, taking him to court. And so this idea that previously these types of scandals, few as they were, were handled on a, like a strict law and order basis, whereas now we can take them into the media and into public spectacle, and the public spectacle having more power in some way, particularly with the rise of newspapers and radio and now TV as, and social media as well. I don't necessarily know that it stuck the landing as firmly as I wanted it to. Those present implications were there, but not, I don't know, it just kind of seemed to have like a pretty eh ending. But if you're interested in the story from the 1920s, in the Teapot Dome scandal, and in this really, really weird and wild story that Maybe you know the name Teapot Dome, maybe you don't. As a political scandal, it probably does have fairly present implications just in general and its context as well. I thought that it was really well written, but again, I judge nonfiction books in particular rather harshly on how well they stick the landing. Didn't think it was that great, but I certainly didn't not enjoy the time that I spent reading it. and. It might just be like the kind of easily listenable nonfiction that you're interested in if you like that sort of thing. So I told you that I want to tell you about a nonfiction book that I finished listening to but I didn't 
give a rating to. And I'm going to explain that. So the book in question is The Fractured Republic, Renewing America's Social Contract in the Age of Individualism by Yuval Levin. This is one of the books that I read in my effort to read across the aisle as you will. I feel like I have pretty much told everybody here that I'm a fairly liberal Democrat and Yuval Levin is a conservative Republican. And I knew that going into the book and I had an inkling when I started that I was not going to give this book a rating for the sheer fact that I figured that I was not going to agree with some or many or all of Levin's ideas just because of our political and ideological differences. I really liked Levin's opening, actually. He talks about both parties being prey to this selective nostalgia, trying to motivate voters by this time that was great for the party, each party, Republicans and Democrats, they, they look at different times and saying, look at when we were great and everything was wonderful because we were in charge and we could do this. And if you elect us back into office again, we can bring you back to this time. And that was really interesting because I think that he's certainly not the first person to talk about this idea of nostalgia and how that is really poisonous in our politics because we're constantly looking back and never forward and trying to recreate a time that can't come back to us. And for both parties to lean on it so heavily is just really dangerous. That was a lot of his opening and it made me interested to continue reading the rest of it, thinking that, you know, as he said, he wasn't going to hide his own political opinions, but he was going to try to be thinking about a way forward for both parties. This book was published uh, in 2016, and I do wish that there was maybe a more updated version of this that I could have read because some of his arguments in lieu of how the Republican Party turned with the Trump presidency um, are just completely out of the water now and I think it would take a, a very sharp and hard turn to get back to some of these ideas. However, the book ended up falling apart for me for two reasons. One, which is as with many of these philosophical political books on both sides of the aisle, there were no concrete steps that we could take right now to help move this vision forward. Even if I did or did not agree with it, there was no concrete steps. And at a certain point, he even said, the next generation will put this into action. And I was like, oh, I hate, I hate when people say that. That's not helpful. And I don't know why you would, if you have all these great ideas to change things, would push them off onto the next generation. Why can't we do something now? Secondly, his views ended up being very anti-LGBTQ and very pro going back to church. And so his views ended up being very family values and very return to the small town in the church. That's a fairly standard conservative Republican idea. Again, not mine, but that's not why I read this book. However, I felt in the way that he was discussing it, there was a large amount of nostalgia in how he was describing this like way to fix this t small town community and everything like that. And for someone who had spent a large portion of the beginning of the book talking about how dangerous that kind of nostalgia is, it just felt very odd. And I didn't get anything in the book to explain to me how this vision of this return, and he uses the word return, was not also kind of cloaked in nostalgia. And I was like, if you want me to believe in that, you have to explain to me how that's different. So again, I didn't rate it because even though I read the whole thing, I don't even know how I would rate this book because I didn't agree with it quite a lot in the end, but I didn't read it because I knew that I was going to agree with it and to rate something poorly when I knew that I wasn't going to agree with it seems rather odd to me. Again, I'm trying to read widely. I'm trying to read a whole bunch of different ideas. And this was a attempt at one of those. It was interesting, definitely had some things to chew on, but ultimately didn't really work for me. But I will continue to read books that continue to push thinking just because I'm curious. I don't know if you guys know this, but I read 
a lot. <laughs> That's everything I have for you guys today. I hope that you found some interesting titles here. Maybe just in the first four, I know that I'm one of the few people on the planet who enjoys reading political philosophy books, but thank you so much for hearing me out and I will see you guys next time. Bye.